Good to see everyone back out this evening. Had a fine service this morning. Hoping for one tonight. Amen. It's a blessing to be here with you. Uh, Brother Sam Enzer, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the scene. It'll be a blessing to you. Pray for the priest's work. God, be with your man to get him that which is needful for us to hear. Help us to go away. Say it's been good to be in the house of God tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 If you would stand and get your All American hymnal, turn to page number 286, the first Noel. Page 286. The first Noel the angels did say Was to certain poor shepherds In fields as they lay In fields where they lay Lay keeping their sheep On a cold winter's night That was so
Amen. Lord bless you and be seated. I tell you, Herod didn't like it when they asked the question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? My, my, do you remember him, Herod the Great? It's good to be here tonight and hope, uh, hope uh, uh, good Lord shows up and blesses in the service. We're going to, be at, we're going to have the uh, candlelight service here in a few minutes. We'd like to welcome any visitors we might have. Anybody here first time? All right, I have a lady right over here. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Where are you from? Good to have you. Amen. Good to have you. All right. All right. Well, let's turn back over to the brother here. I'd like to invite the choir up. We'll sing out of the All American Hymnal, page number 293, Away in the Manger, All That We'll Come Sing. If you would stand again, get your church hymn, all American church hymn, turn to page number 364. There is a name I love to hear. 364. <laughs>
seated as the choir comes down. thinking while they were singing that name of Jesus. 2,000 years from now, do you think, my friend, they'll be talking about uh, the good old U.S. of A. if the Lord doesn't come back? Or will they be talking about Jesus? <laughs> you better believe it. A name above every name. Let's have the ushers come up here tonight. We'll take up the evening offering. Kind of disappointed, folks. I've been listening for a shout and haven't heard it yet. Amen. 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 <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, time we have together tonight. Time of remembrance, thankfulness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In that name I pray. Amen. amen. Debbie McLeod's going to sing tonight. How does this, where are you going to sing now? Okay, come ahead. I didn't know if it's part of the candlelight service.
three or four of them were here 20 years ago most of them weren't that's how quickly the new generation can come on and they're learning the songs that we sang when we were children amen well i'm going to speak to you for just a few minutes tonight and then we'll go into our candlelight service if you have your bible turn back to the book of psalm chapter number 22 with me please 22nd psalm if you remember i just touched on this this morning in what's called the uh, Trilogy, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th Psalm. Psalm chapter number 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Father, thank you for this word. Give us the Give us the sense, the spiritual understanding, our Heavenly Father, to understand it. Open our eyes and our ears and our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll remember 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus was crucified, he quoted that. He said those very words. This psalm was 1,000 years old when he did that because it is a psalm of David. I have here a book that's called The Treasury of David. It's written by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Mine comes in three volumes, and it's really a composition. He has his commentary on it, but he includes a lot of the works of other men of his time, and it's an outstanding reference. It's beautiful. The Treasury of David. If you want to buy something and put a little, uh, put a little money into it, this right here would be one of the best that you can uh, buy. I'm going to be reading from it here in just a few minutes. But I want you to keep in mind, the 22nd Psalm is the crucifixion star, uh, psalm. It starts with a cry that we heard by reading the New Testament. We know the Lord Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God. In verse number six, it said, I'm a worm and no man. Well, the Bible said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He compares himself with that serpent of Moses. He even told that to John, to Nicodemus in John chapter number three. He said, as he lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he gave that as a type of what he endured when he went to the cross. Uh, we do not know the depths of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand the physical suffering, but it went much further than that. In Isaiah chapter number 53, if you'd like to look there with me tonight, it says this in Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 11, Isaiah 53, 11. Listen to this. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, my friend, think about it tonight. The Lord God saw the suffering of his son, his body, and it was the body of the God-man. 
But I want you to understand something. Physical suffering is one thing. Spiritual suffering is another altogether. Yeah. Amen. A lot of folks endure physical suffering, some of them every day of their life. But the spiritual suffering when the soul is cast into the depths of darkness, that's something that uh, you can't handle. A lot of folks just end it. They can't handle that because there's no peace, no light, no joy. There's nowhere to turn. There's no relief from it. And it's a horrible thing. What happens here is that the Lord Jesus Christ is bearing in his soul all of the sorrow and corruption and all of the curse that Adam's sin brought into this world because the Bible said he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And that statement in itself is not easy to break open and break down. He made him to be sin. And I've heard a lot of folks apply to it and try to make some simple skim across the surface uh, uh, explanation of it. It doesn't work. That gets deep. Made him to be sin. And he did. He made him in my place to be sin. And the Bible says in verse number 27 of Psalm 22, And all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. This is the victor's cry. Victor's cry. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This meant that he had accomplished. He said, it is finished, the victor's cry. It's important to understand this tonight. I can't emph emphasize this more than what I'm about to say to you. Nothing, I don't care how holy it looks. I don't care how great it appears. Nothing can be added to what he did on that cross. That's the finished work of Christ. Anything else is self-righteousness and falls far short of the righteousness of God. And so the last thing we find in verse number 30 of Psalm 22 is this. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Notice that he was cut off out of the land of the living. He had no wife. He had no children. But note carefully how that in his death and his burial and resurrection, he becomes the source of the seed and the source of life for all that are begotten of him, begotten of the Father through Christ the Lord. Amen. He has his children, and I'm one of them in here tonight. Amen. In Psalm 22 and verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. Look at that people that shall be born, that he hath done this. And when you declare the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're declaring the righteousness of a one who lived a sinless, perfect life. Compare the righteousness of Christ with the righteousness of the Father. The innate righteousness of the Son is identical to the righteousness of the Father, no difference whatsoever, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But the God-man, when he was born in this world, lived throughout 33 and a half years and every breath, every step, every action, every thought, every deed that he performed when he was here was establishing a righteousness. And that's what he's talking about. Now look at the 23rd Psalm with me tonight. Psalm chapter 23. Notice carefully, 22 is the crucifixion Psalm. He's called the good shepherd. In John chapter number 10 and verse number 14, he said, I am the good shepherd. But here in Psalm chapter number 23, it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You see that? And notice what follows. It has all to do with the care of the shepherd for his sheep. Well, that's what he's doing today. This is why he has pastors. This is what I am. I'm a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I may preach an evangelistic message, but I'm a pastor. The evangelist has his place to be, <laughs> to be respected and used of God. We need, we need the evangelist, but we also have the missionary. We have all of the different offices that uh, complement each other in the body of Christ. We started with apostles and prophets and all the rest of them that made the foundation of what we stand on today. So the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. Can you imagine condescending down to the place of a shepherd? Listen to what Spurgeon says here now. This is beautiful. In his, uh, in his uh, Treasury of David, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. These are the words of Charles Spurgeon. What condescension is this that the infinite Lord assumes toward his people the office and character 
of a shepherd. It should be the subject of grateful admiration that the great God allows himself to be compared to anything which will set forth his great love and care for his own people. David had himself been a keeper of sheep and understood both the needs of the sheep and many cares of a shepherd. He compares himself to a creature weak, defenseless, foolish, and he takes God to be his provider, preserver, director, and indeed his everything. Amen. Have you ever seen a sheep just jump straight up in the air? You ever seen one do that? They just yeah. jump up, click, jump. Did you know, have you ever noticed that when one does that, a bunch of them will do the same thing? They mimic that sheep. They, they copy each other. That's just a kind of uh, uh, ignorance or what? But they follow. Sheep are followers. They're not leaders. One of the most remarkable things is that God calls forth from the sheep his under shepherd. That's what I am. See, I'm a member of the body of Christ. But he reaches out, puts his hand upon me and any other pastor or evangelist and calls us forth from the sheep and makes us a leader. Isn't that a remarkable thing? To me, that's a miracle indeed. Sheep are quite defenseless. That means that the Lord says to you that you must depend upon me for every need of life. And in John 15, he says it plainly, without me, ye can do nothing. <laughs> nothing. You know what the English word nothing means? <laughs> Zip, zero, nothing. Well, I can preach. No, you can't. You can scream and yell, but it takes the Holy Spirit to bring the word of God across to the people and open their hearts to it. Amen. Amen. I can sing. Yeah, you may be able to keep the tune and carry the voice. But let me tell you something. If it's going to come from the heart and from the soul and touch men and women and move their soul, it's going to come by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's like preaching, like anything you do. Without him, you can do nothing. And I learned that it took decades to really get a hold of that fact that without him, you can do, you can make all the plans in the world. You can be so organized, it's not funny. And yet without the power of the Holy Spirit of God, it's just so much busy work. And that's all it is. It may be good intention, but without him, you can do nothing. Abraham, Abel, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph were all shepherds and two of the greatest leaders of Israel, two of the greatest leaders, Moses and David were shepherds. In the book of Zechariah, chapter number 11, and verse number 17, here's a remarkable statement. If you'd like to turn there, because you'll see something. Zechariah, chapter number 11, and verse number 17. This is very interesting. Zechariah 11, and verse number 17. Now, we're looking at a shepherd here, and here's a prophecy. We're looking forward to a certain type of shepherd. Now look at this, Zechariah eleven seventeen. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now wait a minute. If I'm idle and I'm not doing anything, how do you spell that? I-D-L-E. Look what you have in your Bible. How's that spelled? I-D-O-L. In other words, he's an object of worship. That's what he is. What is he? He's a type of the Antichrist. Fact of the matter is, he is the Antichrist because he has a deadly wound to his head. And the deadly wound to his head, according to Revelation chapter number 13, causes him to die. And then he comes back to life again. And when he comes back to life again, he comes back as Satan incarnate the mystery of iniquity. And when he comes back to life again, as Satan incarnate the mystery of iniquity, the whole world will cry out, who, who, who can stand against the beast or the antichrist? For he has all power. Anybody that can raise the dead, they have power. Keep this in mind. God gives him the power to do what he does. Without the hand of God, none of this could happen. Now watch verse 15. Zechariah 11, verse 15. The Lord said unto me, 
take unto thee at the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For I, for lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off. See the sovereignty of God? Now go back in verse number 13, Zechariah chapter number 11. Look at this. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter a goodly price that I was prized at the time. And I took what? 30 pieces of silver. What did Judas Iscariot get when he sold the Lord? Isn't that something? That's quite remarkable, don't you think? That means that the Almighty, <coughs> in his own way, for his own purpose, because he is God and upholdeth all things, all things, this was prophesied because he let it happen. Judas Iscariot shows up and so does the Antichrist in contrast to the true shepherd. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our true shepherd. Now here's the third Psalm 24 of the trilogy. Notice what it says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We start with crucifixion, Psalm 22, and then we go to Psalm 23, the, the, uh, the shepherd and uh, the uh, guiding shepherd of life. And then Psalm 24, we find the exalted king shepherd. The first one is the good shepherd, Psalm 22. The second one is the chief shepherd, Psalm chapter number 23. In 1 Peter chapter number 4, 5, verse number 4, he's called the chief shepherd. And Peter lays out how he guides and leads us in our life. But now we come to the great shepherd. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 20. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work do, to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's one of the scriptures that I memorized right after I got saved. But my mind is not what it used to be. And a lot of people say, I oh, know it's not. Nowhere near what it used to be. And I can't remember a lot of the scriptures that I memorized at that time. But that's a beautiful scripture. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Why is he the chief shepherd? Because he, or I mean the great shepherd, because he was brought forth from the dead. He's victor now. He was, he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So when you get to the 24th Psalm, look what it says in verse number 7. Psalm 24 in verse number 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. In antiphony, in other words, a voice against a voice. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty is the answer. The Lord mighty in battle. Question or the statement again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And the antiphony. Who is this king of glory? The answer, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. I belong to the winning side, folks. I belong to the side that's going to reign on this earth one day. I belong to the king of glory. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. My sins have been forgiven. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to commit that, keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know who took me out of hell and wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Religion can never do that for you. Church membership will never do that for you. Turning over a new leaf, living a good life, trying to be the best you can will never do that for you. You must cast yourself upon the Lord Jesus. You must take hold of that shepherd and trust him with all your heart and all your soul. And him. Now here's a lot of preaching today and I begin to find fault with it. They're talking about putting your faith in everything about the Lord Jesus instead of the Lord Jesus. Yes. Be very careful. Yeah. Our faith is not so much in what he did. That's a knowledge matter. That's what we know he did. Thank God for what we know he did. Our faith is in him. Yes. You got to keep that in mind. Put first things first. He takes preeminence over everything. Amen. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I allow myself the fact that I can make mistakes and I may misunderstand some of the things he said and some of the things he did. I may make the wrong application to it. I'm premillennial. I believe in the rapture. And uh, I mean, I make no bones about it. If you listen to me preaching a period of time, you'll know that. But I'll tell you this right now. That's not saving me. And that doesn't really separate me. Doctrine will never separate you. You say, well, I want to walk with the Lord. I want to be separate from the world. Then it's the Lord Jesus that will separate you. Not anything you can do that will separate you. You can say, I don't believe in what they believe. That's good, but that doesn't separate you. It's the Son of God that sets us apart. He is the one. He's my shepherd tonight. He's my shepherd. And I thank God for what he's done for me. He's the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and the great shepherd. Praise be to God. And I say once again, this is a good book, folks. And you can get it on, on uh, Bible programs. And there's a lot of good Bible programs out there. Accordance is a good one for Mac users and Logos for, for Windows, but you can also get Logos for Mac. It'll go either way. And then there are others, eSword, which doesn't cost you anything, and they have modules online. A lot of information is available. If you have a little laptop computer today, you have access to thousands and thousands of books that are in electronic form, and you can just, you can just, you can just wear yourself out and research and read and read until you drop in your tracks and then get up and read some more, and you'll never get it all read. There's no way. There's too much information out there. But you have all that at your hands. In my office, I've got a, I've got a library. In, uh, in, my, in my home, I've got a library. Uh, when we moved down here and cleaned up this building and remodeled it, I threw about half of them away. A lot of them were, tra were prophecy books, just a bunch of junk, written at the time to make money to sell books and as meaningless and useful as they could possibly, useless as they could possibly be. But I've got some good books back here. But they're nothing compared to a computer I have back there. Open it up, log on to one of these Bible programs, and I've got all this information in my hand. Lagos, you can log on and you can have hundreds of commentaries right there in front of you. Dictionaries, lexicons, all this information is available if you want to study the Bible. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And the treasury of David is found. You can find it, you can have it, and it's there for you. Amen. I hope you have a desire to study the Bible, learn the Word of God. Yes, I do. Study to show thyself approved. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Father, thank you for your Word time we have in the house tonight for this precious time that we have to give back for what you've given us. You've blessed us. You've blessed me. You've blessed me beyond my wildest imagination. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Amen.
Isn't that beautiful? You have something to give. I used to go with my grandfather over to Jacob's building. You know where Jacob's building is? We'd stand in line for two or three hours. The line wrapped all the way around to the top to get a basket of food, and they'd give the, my brother and I a little toy to play with. So I know what that's like, and I thank God for everything he's done for me and what you do tonight for these folks. Amen. Job, 1,900 years before Christ, 4,000 years ago, almost said this, my day. And that was a direct reference to his birthday. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand up tonight, folks. That's it, I suppose. And um, we need to, uh, what are we going to do with this food now? Need to carry it up to the other building? There you go. Young men, right? Young men. Get some young men to come up and carry it up to the other building. All right. Okay. Brother Crane, dismiss us, please. Amen. Mm-hmm.